you guys are so quiet. You're waiting for the explosion, aren't you? <laughs> I know. Okay, I'm going to start with a quote here. Um, and you, you, you should know, if you, if you ever go to our website, I, I can't remember, honestly, last time I went to our website, I'll admit that. But I know there's a picture of me, and underneath it, it basically just says, I'm, I've been fighting the institutional church for like three decades, and I'm always late. So, but, but you still love me, even though I'm late to every meeting. Um, that's about it. That's all it says, and people must really wonder about me. But that first statement about me fighting the institutional church, um, it actually kind of is in evidence in this message a bit. So just bear with me. And um, Tammy, maybe after this message, you'll think, uh-uh, I ain't, <laughs> ain't going to hang with him. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll leave it on. I'm just really... Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, here's the quote. Some forms of religion could be more accurately classified as mental illness given their power to distort the human mind and spirit. Whoa! Who said that? Yeah. I've, I've, and I've never done that before. I've, I've never quoted myself before. So, yeah, yeah. I could not find a good quote, and I thought, well, I'll come up with my own quote. Um, if you want to damage a person, um, have them be regularly exposed to some churches. I'm serious. Okay? Uh, guilt is kind of the um, weapon of choice for a lot of churches. Uh, guilt for, for being born into sin. Guilt for experiencing unavoidable human passions. Huh. Guilt for not believing with um, sufficient zeal. Guilt, guilt for, for, for questioning settled beliefs within the church. I uh, feel guilt for, um, for doubting, for, for not spreading uh, that church's so-called quote-unquote gospel. Uh, guilt for enjoying what are deemed to be unholy pleasures. Mm. Guilt for marrying outside the church. Guilt for divorcing. Guilt for skipping church. Oh my gosh. Guilt for attending the wrong church. And when you finally decide and get the courage to leave the church, guilt for leaving the church. Right? Yeah. From the earliest days, many churches have used weapons of manipulation and shame and embarrassment and disgrace to accommodate and to accomplish its purpose. There are exceptions. I mean, there's amazing congregations out there. But the church so often has unfortunately used its power and its authority and its influence to guilt people into joining that church or becoming a part of that church. Hmm. I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, uh, extremely um, conservative churches, theologically and socially, um, use shame to push people, you know, uh, to coerce them, if you will towards specific doctrines and creeds, statements of belief. And I've seen very progressive churches as well, uh, liberal churches, if you will, to coerce people into certain behavior. But folks, folks, whether the church is trying to compel people to follow their Jesus or to have them recycle plastic bottles, it makes little difference to that person who's being shamed. Okay? An individual, bless his heart, came to me for counsel a number of years ago. And um, his congregation was in a new building project. They were building a, a new facility. And he was experiencing some uh, financial hardship. And he couldn't keep up with the pledge that he made to the church. So he got received from the church a letter that was encouraging him to stay with his pledge. Understandable. But at the bottom of that letter, it, it told him to really encourage him to keep up with his pledge because failure to do so would grieve the Lord and his name would be added to a list of delinquent givers. <laughs> yes. Fearing the humiliation of financial hardship 
being put out there in his delinquency, being revealed to the church, he left the church. And he, it, a lot of pain there, and people hold on to that pain, and they don't forget it. Another person came to me from a very progressive church, and um, she was a pacifist, though her family uh, had had members in the military. And she, um, she had heard a church member share some derogatory things about the military. And she said, my grandfather and my dad both served in the military. I love them, and they are kind and gracious and gentle people. The scuttlebutt began to go through that church, though, that she was some sort of warmonger. She left the church. Understandable. I'm weary of the church and its efforts to manipulate people and shame and use Bible verses to justify their attitude and their behavior and their approach to God's children. God's word was not meant to divide. It was meant to build up. But oh my gosh, how we use these verses. Someone quotes you a verse to, uh, you know, to justify what they believe, and then you come back to them. With, it doesn't go anywhere, verse after verse. You know, throwing verses at each other. I don't think that's how God's word was intended. We're to build each other up and learn from one another. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. Oh my gosh, Easter's going to be here before we know it, right? And it's this six-week journey towards that day we celebrate our Lord's resurrection. Six weeks, of, six weeks of introspection and reflection and looking upon ourselves and where we are in our relationship with God and this world. It's a season, though, that the church has had a terrible history in using the season to justify using shame and guilt upon people, reminding them what terrible sinners they are. Hmm. Through the centuries, the church has used Lent to get people back on track. And it seems to me almost back on track more with the church and its teachings more than with God. And sometimes they're not the same. Okay? Any theological belief that claims to be biblical must be given careful examination. And I challenge you many Sundays, examine everything I'm sharing with you folks. Do not take it hook, line, and sinker. I'm trying to get you to think and be challenged and grow and find God in your path. Many Christians <sighs> seems like they buy more into the church and its authority than the authority of the Holy Spirit. And that can be very frightening and scary. Here's another quote. Many Christians follow the church's example, okay? and root through Scripture till they find a verse they can season with an interpretation that satiates their appetite to be right. Like pigs rooting through mud till they find a truffle to feast upon, too many Christians are covered in the mud of their self-righteousness proclaiming, I'm right and you are wrong. Where'd that quote come from? I know! I did it again! I've never done it. I've done it twice today. I couldn't find a good verse or a good quote again, so I thought, oh, quote yourself, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> okay, enough of quoting me. Many of us, many Christians have grown up with the doctrine of original sin. Let me just offer an example here, what the church does. Okay? Asserting, especially this time of year during Lent, asserting that Adam and Eve's disobedience I had led to all humanity being born into the state of sin. Okay? It's actually very popular. Okay? Augustine, uh, around 400 AD, okay, helped to make this more popular, and this belief uh, became a core tenet, uh, creed within the church of original sin, and it was a key reason why many infants get baptized because they were born into sin. Okay. Follow this line of reasoning that the church has followed, much of the church has followed for centuries. Follow this line of reasoning, and billions of people have been condemned to hell because they weren't baptized because a couple named Adam and Eve partook of some fruit sometime in the past. 
you can buy into it. I'm not buying into it. Okay, I just need to let you know where I am with that. And it seems to me to do so, to buy into that whole original sin, seems to make God, at the very least, eccentric. And at worst, perhaps a sadistic tyrant. The church through the centuries has used Lent to lift up this Adam and Eve story, to shame people, to let them know that they are broken, that they are darkened in their soul. And it, it keeps the church in power over the people. Essentially, you know, come to us to be baptized because you were born into sin, okay? You need us. But you know what? That, mm, there's this creation story with Adam and Eve in it in Genesis 2. But there's another creation story. You know, Genesis was written by more than just one author. The youth today were trying to find out who the author was of Exodus. Didn't have a lot of luck with that, did you? No, no. Many individuals, cultures involved in this, okay, in the writings. There is another creation story. It begins our Bible. And it's a bit more uplifting than the Adam and Eve creation story. Uh, but it doesn't, this first creation story you find in the Bible really doesn't, has not been used by the church during Lent because it doesn't serve the church's purpose as much. Let's look at the story. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Mm. In the context of the creation story, okay, man and woman are called to be fruitful and to multiply and care for creation. They are blessed by God. They are called good. It's a vastly different story from the Adam and Eve story. This first creation story here in Genesis 1, man and woman are created together. It suggests equality. The second story, Eve is created from Adam, and the church has often interpreted that as implying that Eve is subservient, that women are subservient to the Adams of the world. In the first story, be fruitful and multiply and care for creation. In the second story, Adam and Eve, they're cowering in a garden, ashamed of their nudity. In the first story, it suggests that our relationship with God is filled with wonder and trust and blessing and love. And in the second story, it features disobedience and failure and punishment. Dear friends, it's like one story is about original sin and the other is about original blessing. If only the church chose to focus upon that blessing, upon our potential, rather than condemning us for our brokenness. Through the centuries, especially, yes, I know it's like a broken record, especially in Lent, the church has emphasized beliefs and creeds, statements of belief, and uh, uh, stories out of Scripture with very little interpretation. Let us interpret it for you. Let us do the hard work for you. Let us remind you how broken you are. The church mm, has promised to deliver people from the grip of sin while perpetuating its grip on institutional power and wealth. That's just pretty blatant and just, just putting it out there. Okay? For far too long, God's children have been compliant and fearful of not getting into heaven. And so people have endured the spiritual abuse, the physical, and yes, even the sexual abuse at the hands of clergy. It's far beyond time for us to say enough. Enough! It's madness! It is. Enough with the focus on the guilt and the fear and the shame and the rejection. Enough with dangling the afterlife out there like some carrot, you know, that's going to be ours if we obey the church's teachings. The predominant focus of Jesus' teachings were on this life that we're living right now, not in some afterlife. Yes, I get it. Lent can be a beautiful time to reassess where we are in our relationship with God and with each other and look at areas in our life that aren't exactly Christ-like and that we need to work on. We're always a work in progress, right? 
the desire to improve our relationship with God, though, should not arise out of fear and shame and guilt. It should arise out of love. Mm -hmm. But sadly, through the years, the church kind of cherry-picks verses, as many of us do, to justify our attitude and our beliefs and our stances on things. And so often, we, we, we can justify our negative perception of one another. That person's just wrong. And why? Why does the church do this? To convince us that we need the church. No. We need the church in our life if we're going to get to heaven. Eh. Enough with that. Really, I, I, I think we just kind of need Jesus. I think. Yeah. I don't know, but I believe that. A, a woman came to me, and it's just, just another example. She came to me, oh gosh, I guess it was in my last church. Doesn't matter. And she had shared with me that, um, you know, she's being taught, uh, once again in, in, in her church, that... Um, her husband's the head of the household. I said, okay. You're talking about the letter to the Ephesians. She said, yes, I am. Yeah, and she, said, she went on to say, well, the church is sharing that with me. I said, okay. And she said, well, well, you know, and they're telling me he has the last word and that I need to obey him. And I said, this is beginning to sound like their interpretation is sounding a bit manipulative to me and potentially even abusive. I said, yeah, your husband's the head of the household, as Scripture says there. The head of the household, like Christ, is the head of the church. Christ laid his life down for the church. He gave it all for the church. Yeah, I, I, I get that, if that's where that's going. But I told her, you need to read on, because you'll see that Paul, or the, the author of the letter of Ephesians, speaks of a mutually sustaining and loving relationship between the two. It sounds like your church is wanting to keep women in their place, whatever that place is. And she did say, well, the church does not allow her to take any leadership in the church. And that her pastor, and she, she had asked about it, and her pastor said he would pray for her, that um, her heart would soften, soften, and she would end her rebellious spirit. She told the pastor, essentially, enough. And she left the church. And he said to her, I will pray for your soul. And she said, my soul is perfectly fine. Thank you. But she lost a number of her friends from that church. And her husband began to belittle her over her religious stances. And she became very close to saying enough to her husband. This season of Lent, perhaps we do need to learn to say enough to whatever authority keeps us from reaching our God-given potential. Okay? Abusive institutions and people with power, they need us to need them to stay in power. You know, I'll take care of you. You need me. Your life will be better with, for, with, with me. You know, vote for me. Stand with us, you know? You know, do what we say. Do what I say. Your life is going to be so much better. We have the path to a better life. We have the way to heaven, right? You're broken. You're a sinner. There's not a better season designed to be abused than the season of Lent for this kind of talk. I mean, there's... Oh, I'm going to get so in trouble here. Um, there, there's some beloved hymns out there, and I'm kind of giving it to hymns a bit only because they've been around a lot longer and been... Um, kind of enforcing this sense of darkness within humanity. But here are some hymns, just some quick lines that Christians have been singing, you know, for centuries. A Lord, I deserve thy deepest wrath, is the name of it. And in it we sing, my heart is vile, my mind depraved, my flesh rebels against thy will, I am polluted in thy sight. Or approach my soul, the mercy seat, bow down beneath a load of sin. How sad our state by nature is. It says enough. Thank you, Isaac Watts. Not the malice nor profane, by nature and by sin, heirs of immortal misery, unholy and unclean. God be merciful to me. I am evil, born in sin, mm. stricken, smick, smitten, and afflicted. Boy, that sounds like a fun one to sing, doesn't it? 
<laughs> yeah, let's sing this one. Jesus, lover of my soul, really? False and full of sin I am. Just want to remind you, yeah, Jesus loves your soul, but remember, I need thee, precious Jesus, really? I need thee, precious Jesus, for I am full of sin. My soul is dark and guilty. My heart is just dead within. Ugh. I'm sorry, guys. Rock of ages. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Ugh. That's an uplifting one. Ama I'm sorry, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, so blind, right? I'm tired of singing this song reminding me how wretched and blind I am. I know we love Amazing Grace so many, but I'm tired of it. I am. I am so in trouble now. Uh, I'm tired of Lent reminding us how sinful and wretched we are. We know it already. Oh, my gosh. And you have, <laughs> there's been, there's been instances where I've had a pastor, you know, ask me or challenge me to confess my, my sin, and, and he mentioned whatever it was, and I, I, it's like, well, I, I don't connect with that. And it, pray, confess, you'll feel better. Fine, I'll confess for doing something I didn't do, and I guess I'll feel better, right? Oh, this Lent, may God help us to take serious it got a little darker in here, didn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Those are beautiful hymns. They are. They are. It's just there were certain words occasionally. Subliminal stuff that, yeah. This Lent, <laughs> this Lent may God help us <laughs> and help me to take serious our human potential. If you need to be reminded you're a sinner, if you really do, fine, you're a sinner, okay? You feel better? Yeah. Okay, you are. Let's move on. Do we need a season to focus upon beating ourselves up? No. No, we, we need a season to genuinely reflect where we are in our relationship with God and how much God loves us. Um, you know, the Bible does not sanction the season of Lent. Uh, I mean, it sounds like you, got to, you must have, thou shalt have the season of Lent during the year before Easter. No, no, it doesn't say that. You know, so may our prayers and our songs reflect God's inclusive love and concern for all people. Hmm. May we take seriously the power of human intellect and ingenuity and creativity and reason. May we identify with each other primarily not through our gender or our sexuality, but simply the, by the reality that we are God's children? Oh my gosh. May the church not use the Bible as some rule book of immutable laws okay, that keep people in their place. Rather, may the church embrace the Bible as this unfolding, beautiful love story between God and humanity. The Bible is divinely inspired, so helpful and instructive. I mean, it, it, is, it is my comfort blanket here when I speak before you. But the Bible is not exhaustive, and it's not the ultimate authority. The Holy Spirit, God, is. Okay? God's reign, I believe, okay, I'll put that caveat there, but I believe God's reign is best served when people and all Creation are treated respectfully and graciously with the appropriate freedom to discern their own paths and reach their full God-given potential. You know, no longer may we be, our identity be wrapped up in being blind, wretched sinners deserving damnation. Rather, may we see ourselves as God does, as beloved, cherished, valued, accepted, and with infinite worth and potential. And may shame and blame and spiritual tyranny be things of the past, remnants of a fear-based religion. 
And I pray that shame-based churches will become extinct and people are just going to grow tired of being told how broken and sinful they are. I mean, consider, I'm going to just look real quickly here. Consider, for example, Zacchaeus, right, in Luke chapter 19. Here is a tax collector whose job was to be judging, or do, 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 who, whose job was to be collecting taxes for Rome, right? And he was a Jew, and he was collecting from his Jewish brothers and sisters. Hmm. And he was working for the oppressive empire of Rome that essentially had invaded, you know, Zacchaeus' land and the land of his brothers and sisters. He was working for the invading empire. He was a despicable sellout, right? And here Jesus comes through town with a crowd of people, and Zacchaeus being somewhat short in stature, but also probably, you know, used to distancing himself from people, climbs up this tree to, look, to see Jesus. And Jesus sees him, and you know, what does Jesus say? Come on down, Zach, we're going to have a meal together. Scandalous! People couldn't believe it, right? Zacchaeus was an object of scorn and sh- hatred. And... But Jesus' welcoming gesture to Zacchaeus undid old Zach, Right? And Zach wanted to give half of his property to the poor and four times back to those whom he had defrauded. Because I believe he was so undone by Jesus' love and hospitality. He was so undone because before that, I would imagine anyone's attempt to help redeem Zacchaeus was to shame him and let him know how dark and broken and sinful he was. So the question is, how do we treat the Zacchaeuses of our lives? Do we always see them as a rat and a liar without redemption? Would we invite them into our lives as Jesus did? Or would it, would, would, would it be more like this? Would you bring him to your house to eat a meal and meet your spouse? Not for a meal, not in my house. The risks are real for my spouse. I would not meet him in a bar. I would not bandage up his scars. I would not... Like old Zach would sin, I do not like him near my skin. <laughs> Give him hope. Help him be freed. I would not, could not. He's such a drain, always a bore and steeped in pain. You may like him, try. You'll see, you may like him in a tree. I would not, could not in a tree. I could not, would not with Chablis. I do not like to see his pain. I do not waste my time in vain. I do not want him in my house. I do not want him near my spouse. I do not want... Friends of the sword that do not like to go to court. I have a life and stuff to do. I want to sit here in this pew. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Took a while to pull that baby together. Yeah. What are you doing this week, Steve? Why is it so why are you at the office all day? What's going on? What are you doing? I know. Really? Jesus had the time to invite the Zacchaeuses into his life. And he treated Zach with dignity and grace. And Zach experienced redemption. (laughs) He was so lost selling out to the Roman Empire. He was, oh, Zach. Jesus comes along and sees a person worthy of redemption. So, could Jesus' spirit of love and acceptance and forgiveness be replicated in our church this Lent? Do you think it can? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I'm looking for a little more passion. Do you think it can? Yeah. Uh, okay, that sounds good. I like that. Embracing the belief in the power of redemption, of a person turning their life around to God, and a new life, oh my gosh, how beautiful that could be. Of course, we're not to be blind to our sin and to sin in this world and evil in this world and in our midst. We've got to call it out. Get it. But sin must not be the measure of one's life. Real quickly, one other example. I'll bring this baby home. I'm bringing it home now. In Luke 18, there are two men who go into the temple to pray, right? Remember that story? Pharisee and a tax collector. And the Pharisee is praying in that temple. I'm thankful, dear God, that I'm not like that lowly, disgusting outcast tax collector who's a tre- treasonous fellow. I'm not like him. Thank you, God. And of course, the tax collector, though, is envisioning a larger life and asking for mercy and a fresh start and perhaps redemption. 
For too long, the church has been praying like that Pharisee. Seeing only the sin in others. Blind to that person's promise and potential. A church true to the spirit of Jesus sees through and beyond human sin and speaks to a deeper longing, a deeper hunger for mercy and redemption and the God-given potential every person has been given. May that, dear friends, be our focus this Lent. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh.